How is Hello. it, sir? How you doing? I'm good. I can hear you perfectly. Oh, great. Well, look, this is an actual massive honor. I, I, I thank you ever so much for taking the time to do this. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm a huge fan, obviously. I think anybody that loves music would not be... <laughs> how could we not be a fan of yours? I mean, you've played on so many incredible records. It's uh, So I'll get all the gushing out of the way first, you know. James, so VH1 did a list in 2000 of 100 greatest dance songs, and you played on number one and number two. Number two, of course, being Don't Leave Me This Way, which was released in 76, and the number one was... I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor. I talked to Thelma about Don't Leave Me This Way, and she said her recollection of it is just coming to sing on top of the finished track. So she didn't have any uh, kind of insight in, on the recording. It wasn't, at the, it wasn't at a Motown studio. We didn't know we were going to cut it that day. It was no, uh, we, didn't have any, we didn't have a chart or anything. And uh, the producer was Hal Davis. And he uh, came up with the idea because we had heard the record, uh, Teddy Pendergrass had done it. We had a good time, you know, recording it. So, so good. I mean, we were playing. The, I don't know if the, if you could hear, you know, the extended version. You can hear the, the uh, contractor coming in because he, he said we was taking too much time. You could hear the door slam. You know, he was cutting the session off. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But it was, uh, you know, John Barnes, Henry Davis, who's no longer with us. Uh, he was with the LTD later on. And and me, we had a good time. And Thelma is such a great person and, and a fantastic singer. You know, I mean, I was, I, I've, I've always uh, I've been a fan of hers, even before I met her. So you just got given charts there and then, and you just started playing the track? We listened to it, and we uh, worked out the parts, you know, because it was a little different than uh, the one Teddy Pendergrass has. We did a disco thing on it. We just worked it out. I didn't think nothing of it. I mean, it was a session, and when the contractor came and closed the door because he said, uh, you know, the, the, to it, what they were doing then, if you cut over five minutes of disco, see, they were they had what they call three-hour recording sessions. If you cut over five minutes of disco, then that was a session. That's the way the union did it. So it became a, a, a hit record. And so that was that was great. That was great. You know, I was so happy for her. And for you, I, I mean, you, you've been a part of so many eras because obviously you had massive tracks earlier in the 70s with Bill Withers and Jackson 5. Charles Wright, but at that point, I mean, you were... did you ever hear Dyke and the Blazer stuff? That was my uh, introduction into the recording business, you know, recording studios. Uh, Al McKay, the guitarist that was with the Earth, Wind, and Fire, he said, Man, you want a session? I said, Yeah. See, I was a jazz drummer, so I had just switched over to start playing R&B. And so we did that, and uh, it became a hit. I could call Funky Walk. I was so surprised, you know. And uh, so that was that was the beginning of everything. And then the Watts band, I was working with them at the sa at the same time. Then we got with Bill Withers and made some amazing records. You know, that was a great, great thing. And then I was blessed to, to go into the studios and, you know, work for Motown. That was a, a high regarded position to have. At that time, I mean, Motown it was uh, second to none as far as uh, the musicianship, you know, in California. That's where I was going to that. I mean, you had to be on it. That was the school for me. Motown was a school. That was incredible. Training. How many tracks were you were you expected to cut a day in those days? Motown, oh, man, we, you know, sometimes I'd be over there for three sessions a day. That was three, three hour sessions. I don't know. I might have cut nine tracks a day sometime. Wow. Sometimes ten. You know, <laughs> uh, because a three hour session you were, you know, a lot of producers were required that you would be able to play three songs. And sometimes they would add a half an hour and if and do another short song. And it was you were reading, you know. And I I uh 
I had to learn how to read, which was cool, which was great for me. That was a, because Motown wrote, the producers at that time, they wrote out all the, uh, everything, especially for the drum, go for the clothes, hi hats, what crash or ride symbols you hit, what toms you hit. They wrote out everything. It might take two takes, but, you know, it wasn't, wasn't a whole lot of three takes or four takes. You know, you had to be on it. And if you, what, if you wasn't on it, they would call you out and get somebody else. It was great for me, though, because, I mean, that was great to, ha- to be, you know, to be in that situation, you know, and because uh, it made you, uh, made you ready. So I, I enjoyed it, and I learned a lot at Motown. That was probably the school for me. That's absolutely incredible. I didn't know that it was that carefully orchestrated and that all the parts were written like that. Well, when, when I was there, you know, in Detroit, I'm sure it was different. I mean, they sounded so wonderful. You know, it was a different thing out here in California. I mean, it didn't sound like the Motown in Detroit at all. You know, but but we did. We were successful. We did. We got a lot of hits. Yeah, it was very um, competitive. We use that word competitive. Yeah. So you came from Kansas City, Missouri. That's my hometown, Kansas City. Charlie Parker, <laughs> yeah, right? You know, Charlie they, Parker, um, the, the great right. bird. And I came up. You know, with a lot of saxophone players there. At the time I came up in a very musical town, they had what they called a hit parade and they played all the music on the radio. It just wasn't like the R and B. I mean, they played everything. So in order to work, you had to be able to play everything. You know, if you went on a gig, and, uh, even, even the country records, I learned how to yodel. How did you end up in Los Angeles? Some friends of mine were on the Dean Martin show. And I thought they had made the big time. See, Kansas City, by that time, you know, in the 30s, it was jumping. Jay, you know, it was, it was a country town. That's a Midwestern town. So I see them on the Dean Martin show, and I said, oh, man, they made the big time. They said, come on out. Come on out. I came out. I couldn't play their music. So they couldn't use me because I couldn't play no R&B pop. I, was, I had gotten into jazz. I was a jazz drummer. So they couldn't use me. So it, it was very uh, frightening for about five years. I had to scuffle. You know, I didn't want to go back to Kansas City. I felt that like I would, would you know, I would have been a failure. So I scuffled and, uh, you know, God bless me. And I got through. Were you doing a lot of live gigs? Um, you know, how were well, you growing uh, your chops? I wasn't getting any gigs for, for a while because I didn't know anybody, you know. I would, I, sometimes I'd walk 70 blocks or 75 blocks sometimes to play in the jazz. So I say, man, we don't know you. You know, I'd want to sit in so I, somebody would hire me and say, we don't know you. I had been out here previously. I'd been out to Los Angeles previously playing with the organ trios and the organ quartets. And I met a gentleman, a f- fantastic drummer. He was cut a lot of hit records in New Orleans. His name was John Boudreau. Something you've gotten, all those different things. And I met him. We, I kept his number. So when I came back to California, I happened to find his number. I said, man, if I can find it. He said, man, I'll get you a gig. So he got me a gig with Charles Wright, which paid $12 a night at a strip club. The strippers were off on Thursdays. I had to get on the bus to get my drum. You know, I didn't have you know, I didn't know in transportation. So I carried all my drums on the bus. I'd get on the bus and play the gig. And he fired me about five times because I couldn't play it. That, during that time, was the Motown thing. You know, they was playing the four things and all that. And it was very hard for me to do it because I had been so free. So he found, you know, he found me about five times, and I guess he couldn't get nobody else or whatever it was. He said, well, man, you want the gig? I said, yeah, I need I, So I, he, I got the gig, and he just had me to play the rhythm. That's the four quarter notes on the hi-hat, quarter notes on the snare. Four notes on the bass drum. That was the hardest thing in the world for me to do at that time. And I did it for about eight months. No fields. He said, don't play no fields. So I started to, to listen. And by that, it was a blessing because I was able to create my style. You know, when I started playing with Bill Withers, I was able to uh, play some of the things that I uh, had made up, you know, some of the rhythms and stuff like Use Me and Kissing My Love. How did you get from uh, Charles Wright's band into Bill Withers' band? I met Charles Wright through Bill Withers. I, oh, I think I see. Charles Wright might have managed Bill Withers for a week or something, I think. <laughs> and I met Bill Withers over Charles Wright's 
And, I, you know, about four months later, we went into the studios with the bass, with the, the bass player for the three sounds. I can't think of his name. It was an upright bass, me and Bill with us. We didn't get nothing. We didn't come out with nothing. And so, uh, you know, he paid me and, uh, wow, I guess it must have been a couple of years later. Ain't No Sunshine came out. He got a hit record, you know, Sussex Records. And I said, wow, man, that's great for him. Really don't, I think Ain't No Sunshine came out. Grandma's Hand came out. I don't, I don't I, by that, that was a great record, but it, it didn't do good as a single. Booker T. Jones had produced him. And, and so by that time, Booker T. had went with uh, Willie Nelson. He was producing Willie Nelson, so he didn't have time to produce Bill Withers' second album. So, you know, right in the other room from my studio was a garage at the time. We rehearsed and rehearsed, and, you know, we did some gigs and stuff. And uh, I remember coming back from uh, Washington State. I had, put, I had been working on the Use Me beat, and he heard it, and we came back. And uh, he rushed, we rushed into the studio. My car, well, battery was down in my car. He come and got me. We did 120 miles an hour down to the famous record plant at that time. We cut Use Me. You know, I wasn't no, was no lyrics. We just cut the track. You know, I didn't know what was going to go on. And the next thing, when I heard it again, he had uh, wrote the uh, lyric and the music, which was great. And then the sort of doors open. I mean, Jackson 5, all those disco hits, uh, Saturday Night Fever, I mean, it's... Well, that was great. That was great to, to, to get to play with those with those gentlemen. Um, you know, I got to do, a, you know, a, what was that, a Dance the Machine and all those things. I played with him. I had met Michael way before he got famous. He was about seven years old. And they were working. They, the uh, A gentleman that knew my brother was a promoter, and he had hired him. And uh, Michael was sleeping in the car. I guess they had worked that gig and they were going back to uh, Indiana, I guess. And I got to meet everybody. And Jermaine remembered, J J Jermaine remembered that, you know, Michael was asleep. But um, I got to, you know, but yeah, it was, that was great. See what, what it was at Motown a lot of times. I, we knew, that, we knew when we cut to Jackson's records, but a lot of the other records, we didn't know who it was. They never had the names on the music. So we just played, you know, what was written. You know, so that was one of the few. We knew the Jacksons. Yeah. Very incredible. exciting times. Amazing. And, of course, Saturday Night Fever, which was absolutely Saturday Night Fever. huge. Yeah. That was great. Freddie Perrin, the producer, he was with the, uh, he was one of the producers at Motown before he left and did, was, was doing his own thing. And uh, I did that with him in the, what was that, the Peaches and Herb stuff reunited and, uh, a lot, of, quite a few things with him, different artists, you know. But he was one of the artists that, that uh, he was one of the producers. I'm sorry, that they call him the corporation that, that produced the Jackson Five stuff at the first time. And when I started playing the, the Jackson Five stuff, it was Hal Davis at that time, was producing at that time. So, what to you are your highlights? I mean, your career has been absolutely incredible, and you played on some of the best and biggest songs of all time. I have been truly blessed. I just thank God. I'm a Christian. I thank God Almighty for being able to um, be a musician and make a living at it, you know, because it got pretty, pretty rough when I got out here. And uh, the guys turned me down because I couldn't play their music. I mean, it was <laughs> it was scary, you know. And so, um, I mean, you know, all the I guess all the hit records that I played on, uh, I'm just blessed. But and I I still take that attitude today. I mean, I got to play with Harry Styles, you know, earlier. You know, I'm on his album, so it's a blessing because the younger people. They like the rhythms that I play, so they call me sometimes. I need to let, you know, so that I think that's a blessing. So that's what has kept me going, you know. I know out here in Los Angeles, if any of my friends have made records with you, they they talk, they put it at the top of their list of of the fa of their favorite albums they've ever made. Wow, well, I'm flattered. I'm really flattered. I t I take nothing for granted. I mean, when I go in the studio to play for somebody. You know, it's like being a heavyweight champion of the world. I, I don't take it for granted. But I guess by me being uh, what happened to me when I came out as a jazz player 
and I still I'm I still love jazz. I'm a jazz lover still, but I love all, I love all music. Always did, but I guess what happened for me to you know starving, literally starving to death out here, probably uh you know strengthened my uh situation to try to you know be the best. Did you go home and and just listen to records and play along? How were you? Uh... You know, while you didn't have gigs, how were you getting your, improving your chops? Uh, I just practiced. I mean, I learned, uh, Charles Wright was a studio musician. So, you know, he was what they call a chink man. He played, he was a left-handed guitar. He played the chinks. And, um, uh, I guess I, as when I was in his band, I learned, you know, certain things. So by the time I, you know, I, one thing about it though, they would call and ask for a drummer sometime. We'd be rehearsing. He would never re- recommend me though. I didn't. I didn't like that. I thought that was, I was starving to death. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, I, I got it together playing with the Watson Hundred Third Street Band. So it was more or less. So by the time we went to the studio, the first time we went into the studio when they signed us, Warner Brothers signed us, we didn't go into the studio. They had a truck outside of the nightclub that we worked at, and they recorded us for a month, live every night. And the first single that came out was called Do Your Thing, was a, which was a hit record, you know. Incredible and, record. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's how that happened. You know, as, as it went along, I learned and learned. And Paul Humphreys was uh, wonderful for me because I would go around to the studio sometimes and he would be, be working. He'd say, come here, man, look at this. And, this is how this is done, and this is how that is done. He was very grateful, graceful, really. You know, and, and uh, you know, just told me he knew that I didn't know, and uh, I thought that was a wonderful thing for him to do. In your heart of hearts, what's the one thing that you've worked on that you just you cherish the most? Wow, I wish I could answer that. I mean, different <laughs> times okay. I might listen to different records that I play, and I'm in different moods. You know, the best thing yet I did with Anita Baker. Uh, I mean, you know, Bill Withers is uh, live. I mean, you know, whatever type of movie I'm in, mood, you know. Uh, live at Carnegie is uh, absolutely incredible. Record. Yeah, we had a, we had a great time. The the band was so it was a great that was a great band. I'm still looking, I guess. That's that, beautiful. Uh, That's a beautiful answer. I love I love that. I love that. But I'm glad you mentioned the live at Carnegie because that that is arguably one of the greatest live albums ever recorded. Just you know, uh, it was it was a great time. It was great times. We uh, that was a wonderful band to be in. We we were formerly of the Watson Hundred Third Street Band. That was the rhythm section, you know, and uh, so it was it was great. Beautiful. Well, thank you ever so much for your time. I appreciate it. I, 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 thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Uh, God bless you and um, you know have a have a marvelous day. And uh, I, I appreciate. You taking the time because I'm a huge fan, right, we, and we're gonna, we're gonna work on some Shelby Lynn today. Oh, she did a gospel. She doing a traditional gospel album, you know. So I did the backgrounds and uh, you know singing and uh, gorgeous. I'm gonna do some drums today for her. Nice. So thank you for having me. Thank you ever so much, James. I really appreciate it. All right. Have a marvelous day.